Welcome to the Psych Central Show, where each episode presents an in-depth look at issues from the field of psychology and mental health, with host Gabe Howard and co-host Vincent M. Wales. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the Psych Central Show podcast. My name is Gabe Howard, and with me, as always, is Vincent M. Wales. And this week, we have not one guest, but two And both of our guests are writers of the long-standing Ask the Therapist column, which has been a mainstay on psychcentral.com for quite some time. Please welcome to the show, Marie Hartwell-Walker and Dan Tomasulo. Dan and Marie, welcome. How are you? Uh, Fine, thank you, Gabe. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you, Gabe and Vincent. Thank you so much for having us on the show. Appreciate it. Oh, the pleasure is all ours. So let's start with Marie. Marie, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, why you're qualified to write the column, uh, just maybe a hobby, you know, something so that the listeners can get an idea of who you are? Okay. I guess guess what's most relevant is I've been doing this work for over 40 years, uh, which gives you some idea of how old I am. And I've been working in the course of that 40 years, I've worked in a variety of settings, uh, from private practice for well over 25 years. I worked for a time as the director of a mental health clinic and most recently as the area psychologist for our geographical area of the Department of Developmental Services for here in Massachusetts. What that gives me, uh, Gabe and Vince, is a very large spectrum of experience. Age groups from children who've been brought in by their parents to elders who age I've now caught up to, or college students, or a wide variety of diagnoses, and included in that is a quite wide variety of disabilities. So that's provided me with a nice um, skill set for answering the many varied kinds of questions we have at Psych Central. Is there anything else that would be helpful to know? No, I think that covers it pretty well. Thank you, Marie. Dan, how about you? Okay. You know, my background has been in um, psychotherapy. I'm a psychologist, and uh, I teach. I teach now at uh, at Columbia, but I've been teaching for a number of years uh, on psychology, psychopathology, psychotherapy, that kind of thing. Much of what I've done has been trying to provide newer ways to do psychotherapy in the last several years, mostly with positive psychology, and then trying to help people alleviate their suffering, but then also to have more joy in their life. Thank you so much, Dan. Now, the Ask the Therapist column, it's written by different different therapists, not just you two, but over the years, there's been many different therapists. But Marie, what made you want to write essentially a therapy advice column anywhere? It's been a personal goal of mine since graduate school to be one of the people who could make the work of psychology accessible to the lay public. And I've been writing feature columns and advice columns uh, since I think 1978 for various newspapers and then other websites before I came on with Psych Central. So this is a long-standing personal mission of mine and it's been my pleasure to do that. Dan, did you do any uh, column writing before this? Very little. I had been writing a book, and I think that's one of the things that drew Marie and I together. I had written a memoir, and that uh, she had read it, and then thought it was a good idea that maybe maybe I joined. And I had always wanted to write a, a blog or have a column that was sort of like my, my fantasy all along the way, and this seemed like such a good vehicle. It's also a very brief format. Most of the writing that I had done beforehand, uh, much longer, you know, 2,000 words for a chapter or 2,500 words. And so being able to respond in a very pithy way, uh, more dynamically uh, to help people really, really appealed to me. And I still like that format. For the most part, uh, you know, a question and an answer or as best of an answer as we can come up with. I think that our listeners understand how an advice column works. Somebody writes in a question and it's, it's somehow ends up in, in front of one of you and you answer it. What goes into that answer? What do you consider? Can you walk us through that process a little bit? You know, Dan, this isn't something we've ever talked about, so I'm going to be fascinated to hear what you have to say and uh, <laughs> see if yeah, it matches what I do. 
what your your listeners may not know is that we get very, very little information. What we get is a letter that's supposed to be 250 words. Sometimes it's a little more, sometimes it's a little less. And then we get age, gender, maybe an occupation, and a city or a town or country. That's it. That's all we have to go on. And that's a very different situation than when you're in practice and someone walks in the door and you have a half an hour to ask lots of questions about someone's life. So in my part, Dan, what I'm doing is trying to come up with a hypothetical person based on those very, very, very limited information. A 13-year-old usually has different concerns and a different knowledge base than a 52-year-old. A teenager who's talking about not having friends is different to me than a 40-year-old who's talking about not having any friends. So just those few items of information, those few pieces of information do at least give me a starting point. How about you, Dan? It is true. We get very little information. So part of what happens is uh, when I read something, it's going up against a general sense of, can I get my arms around this question? Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, the, the age of the person and their background, what country they're from. You know, sometimes we're getting questions from other cultures. So what might be appropriate to say for, let's say, an American culture might be very, very different for an Indian culture or an Asian culture. So I, I try to see if I can get my arms around the uh, the answer. If I can, then I try to sketch out one or two things that I, I would want to say back, something Almost always in the beginning to try and validate the person's courage for, you know, writing in, uh, you know, identifying their their strength of character for for just doing that. And then there's a there's a questions that are you know kind of throw me because they'll they'll ask about something that I'm only sort of marginally aware of. So I'll go do some research. It's sort of like oh oh. Now I understand it more. And then if I understand it a little better, then I can get my arms around the rest of the question. And then there were some that are just either inappropriate or, or you know, not not something uh, that I can answer or, you know, um, uh, that I can uh, offer anything on. So it's a, it's a little bit like triage, I guess. Uh, yeah, it is. See you. Well, thank you. I'm curious because you just, you both mentioned that you get questions from outside of, of our country. Can you tell me about what percentage do you think you receive from outside North America? Oh dear, I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know exactly, but I, I will say it's definitely on the rise. I mean, I just answered like ten questions uh, recently, and I'd say uh, six of them were from outside the United States. So wow. I don't know if that's a representative percentage. I, I doubt it, but definitely, you know, we used to get the stray ones, but now it's much more. What do you think? Right. I, I would agree. I don't think that that's a representative sample you just gave us, Dan. It's so, it varies so much week to week. I would say maybe a third are from other countries. Um, yeah, the largest group right. being the largest group being the UK and Canada, and then there's everything from Dubai to Indonesia to India to China, Philippines. It's a pretty wide ranging uh, representation from all over the world at this point. And I agree, it's, it's on the rise. Great. Yeah. I think it's interesting that you get so many questions from outside of the United States, but I'm going to make an assumption here that you were both born and raised in America. How do you handle cross-cultural issues? Because no matter how hard you try, you, you still can only sort of see the world through your experience and your lens as Americans. Yeah. The, the thing I would say about that is that, uh, like, like I'll, I'll give you an example. Somebody who has an arranged marriage, which is not something that's common in the United States, or, you know, we, we know about it, but we really don't experience it on a regular basis. And uh, they're talking about their, their feelings of not wanting to get married to somebody that the parents have um, arranged marriage for. So there's a lot of delicate issues around that because you have longstanding culture, you have family uh, tradition, and yet at the same time, you have somebody who has really uncomfortable feelings. So sometimes the approach is to try and understand what the feeling base is and to give the person an opportunity 
to have a safe place to express those feelings, not really commenting so much on the cultural aspect, but on the feeling aspect, because those, I, at least for me, I think I can get a handle on. I certainly agree with that, and that, that's a really good example of one of the place, one of the challenges of doing a worldwide column is that we do get letters, and that's pretty re that is representative of one group of uh, letters where young people who are becoming more westernized have a different idea about adulthood than their parents. And I think the other thing, Dan, that we bring to this is both of us have been teaching for a very long time. And when you teach in university and college settings, you meet many students from other cultures. So that gives me at least some, a toehold sometimes. I also have uh, grandparents who are immigrants, so have a little bit of direct experience, although I wouldn't make that um, a major piece of my resume. But nonetheless, I have some idea of what it means to speak a different language and to be trying to make your way in, in a country that's not your birthplace. But I, I, again, it, just as Dan said, I think that what we can do best is validate people's concerns and I'm frankly quite upfront sometimes saying, you know, I don't know what resources are available in your culture. I don't know enough about your culture. I can tell you what might be appropriate here in the United States, but I'm not in any way suggesting that that's um, what you should do. So sometimes I think honesty really is the best policy. Like, I don't really know is the answer. But I do know that your feelings are real, and I thank you for writing. Often writing is in itself therapeutic, because it gave someone a place to put some of those concerns and to try to organize their thinking. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp.com. Secure, convenient, and affordable online counseling. All counselors are licensed, accredited professionals. Anything you share is confidential. Schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist whenever you feel it's needed. A month of online therapy often costs less than a single traditional face-to-face -face session. Go to betterhelp.com forward slash psych central and experience seven days of free therapy to see if online counseling is right for you. Betterhelp.com forward slash psych central. Dan, earlier you mentioned that you received a batch of uh, of questions. I assume that among all of the all of the columns you have, that questions are not duplicated between you, and you might get mm -hmm. X number this week and and a different number next week. How many of those though do you actually answer? Is it all of them, or just a percentage, or how does that work? Yeah, that uh, that also is a good question. I, I'd say. You know, a very rough guess is that there's probably 10 or 15 percent that are, are just either so redundant. It, it's a question that's been asked a million times, and it's not it's not necessarily something that's going to pique a reader's interest. And we've we've answered it in a variety of different ways, or that the question is just too inappropriate or too poorly worded. Uh, so I'd say 10 or 15 percent of them you kind of put off to the to the side, and then there's several questions that are just really I, I want to answer. <laughs> I don't yeah. know if that's appropriate, but like it's sort that. of like, like oh my goodness, you know, somebody says uh, I'm deeply in love with you know my boyfriend. He's getting out of jail next week, and he's planning on going back to selling drugs. And you know, I'm afraid my life is going to be in tough shape. Well, I want to answer that question. You know? yes. right. So I guess that what I'm saying is that there are some questions that really pulled me and I feel compelled to have a have a response because it's uh, I think it'll be helpful and it's not it's not redundant and then there are some questions that uh, require more la a more layered approach so I'd say I, I try to answer as many as I can probably mm -hmm. in the neighborhood of 80 percent of what comes in I'd say and if you are correct uh, we do not get the same questions there are four of us on the team and we each get uh, some assortment of questions each week. And like Dan, I go through a sort. There are those that are pretty quick and easy to answer. And then there are those that require some research. It, it might be a disorder that um, I've never heard of because it doesn't exist. Or it might be a, a, a disorder that I'm not particularly up on. Or young people sometimes have a different 
more than they have shorthand, where there'll be a string of initials, and I haven't got a clue what it is. So I need to go to the computer and say, okay, what is this collection of letters, and then find out what it is. Um, but then there's, there's serious research. If someone is writing to me from the Philippines and saying, where do I go? What do I do? I don't want to say, I don't know. So I tend to get on the computer and see if I can find a resource and referral source within the country of origin and direct them there if I can. And then the third area of research, of course, is right into if someone is talking about, well, what's the latest about Prozac and depression, well, I'm not sure I have the latest, so then I'll go read some articles before I answer the question. So, again, some of the questions are not labor-intensive at all. Again, I've been doing this for a long time, and when a 13-year-old complains about their mother, I kind of know what to say. But um, when it's something very complicated from another country, then that's going to require some time. One of the things that Dan said that I thought was really interesting is that a certain percentage of the questions are just so common that you just see them over and over again. So they're they're sort of not worth answering, not because they're not worth answering, but because they've recently been answered in the column. What are your most common questions or questions that you, you see just an awful lot? Oh, Dan, I'm fascinated to know what you're going to say. So I'm going to pass this to you first. <laughs> First of all, it's 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 every it's every plot from every Shakespeare play uh, comes up, you know, every version of Romeo and Juliet. You know, my parents don't like my boyfriend. There's a lot of stuff, really. You know, I'm being kind of uh, cheeky about it, but if you look at some things that have been in classic literature for a very long time, you realize that those themes continue to emerge in different ways. So maybe, you know, the uh, parents don't like somebody because they're a different ethnicity or they're born in a different place or they're, you know, there's something about that. And so it becomes challenging to find a question that's representative of something a little more dynamic uh, so that you can answer it with maybe more finesse. But we get a lot of, mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, uh, yeah, it seems like a lot of that classic sort of stuff is classic for a reason. What, what do you think, Marie? I second that. Uh, cheating is a big one. And I think we're living in a time where what it means to be faithful is different for different people and having to find ways to honor that and to not impose my own ideas about uh, morality on somebody from another place and who has a different definition of what faithfulness means within their couple. So I, I think we're in a time of enormous change, especially in the United States and probably the UK as well, in terms of what does it mean to partner and what does it mean to be faithful to your partner. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, Gabe, is that even with questions I suspect between uh, Dan and myself, we could come up with the 10 most common questions. But even though we've answered the same kind of question 10 times, each individual feels their pain in their own individual way. And I can't tell you the number of letters that start out. I know you've answered a question sort of kind of like mine before, but it's not really like mine. And here's my, and. And for me, it may not be that different, but for that person to feel heard means affirming that, yes, you, you have your own individual experience of this, and let me see if I can be helpful. And sometimes it's just a slight reworking of what I've said 2,500 times before, but I haven't had, had the opportunity to say it to a 16-year-old from Kansas as opposed to a 30-year-old from Finland. There are differences, even though the question is kind of the same. Thank you. Yeah, very now, true. you guys have been doing this for quite some time, so there have been an enormous number of, of <laughs> that you've responded to. Is there one or two that have stuck with you the most, perhaps the most disturbing or shocking questions that you've been asked? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. I think the questions that scare me are the ones where someone is talking about doing violence. 
And fortunately, there is a, a crisis line at Psych Central that I can pass them to. I don't want to be in the position where someone has said, I'm going to wreak havoc somewhere, and nobody responded. But I do think it's important when somebody is talking about being very specifically violent, I think we have an obligation to try to, I, I don't know, respond to it in a way that is, is not just helpful, but that also steers the person to doing something immediately rather than waiting. Sometimes, I don't know about you, Dan, but sometimes I ask the editors to bump a letter to the top because I think it's yeah. that important. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think that would be the uh, the thing I would uh, say is the most disturbing to me. You know, I travel a good deal, and so sometimes uh, it'll be a days before I'll uh, I'll get to open an email. So uh, we we all try to do a few of them ahead, you know, so that there's always some in the hopper. But I'll, you know, I'll open an email and I can see it's three, four, five days old, and the person is talking about you know considering suicide or uh, you know considering something really hurtful to themselves or uh, something drastic. And it's like, oh my goodness, you know, this person reached out in a time of pain. There's mm -hmm. a delay between writing that and then me reading it and me responding to it and then it getting posted. It could be 10 days, it could be two weeks uh, after, or perhaps even longer. And so those kind of things really stick with me. And as Marie said, if uh, something like that happens, we try to make it go back to the top of the list so that you're, you're responding back to that person as quick as possible. It's good that you have that option of, of having them kick it up to the top. That's, that's very good. The, the final question that we really have is, what do you worry most about when you're answering these letters? What's your biggest fear, your, your biggest concern? What's going through your mind when you're answering the letter and, and you send it out there? I can I can tell you what goes through my mind. I, I, I recently did an interview for some publication where they were asking me to count up like how how many hours of psychotherapy I've done or whatever, and the number kind of ston astonished me. It's like fifty thousand hours uh, mm. over the years of psychotherapy, and I was like, oh my god, this is like ridiculous. But I I get constant feedback from the person about my feedback. They can say that was helpful, that wasn't helpful, or I need more of this, or can you explain more of that? Like in, in, a, in a therapy session, there could be 20 exchanges, nuances of feedback mm -hmm. here. You know, you have one shot, one time, you send it out. And I think, in all, all my, I, I think I've only seen one letter come back with the person saying, thank you, it was helpful. The other you know, thousands of them, they kind of go out into the void. You don't, you don't know. I mean, the fact that the column is still there and that like central is, is, is up and running, people are using it. But for me, it's hard because you never know how it lands. How did it work out? You know? Oh, I absolutely agree with that. I, I just gave what I am most concerned about is that people don't give it too much power. They've written me a letter of 200 words. I've responded with 200 words. Uh, we've certainly done our best to provide some support and help, but it shouldn't be seen as the last word on something. And uh, of the, say, let's just go round numbers, say I answered 10 this week. Out of those 10, I've probably referred people back to the therapist that they've said that they are seeing or I've suggested that it might be helpful for them to follow through. And the reason for that is that I want them to see the letter as a first step, not as a final step. That it's a way of maybe organizing their thinking or getting some preliminary help, but that the real help comes from being with a therapist who can hear their whole story and who can provide ongoing support and guidance in solving their problem. And I've often suggested that people take their letter with them as a way to break the ice. People get very concerned. What do I say when they go see the therapist? Well, take your letter and my response. And your idea about my response, was I off the wall or did I have something to say that was helpful? It's a good first step toward getting the healing journey going, but it shouldn't be the final one. 
Thank you both so much for being on the show. Before we go, uh, both of you are, are accomplished therapists, accomplished authors. Uh, I think between the two of you, you've, you've written double digit number of books. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do when you're not answering Ask the Therapist questions for Psych Central? And uh, Marie, we'll, we'll start with you. Well, the first response is playing auto harp. Um, <laughs> with my ongoing passion and hobby. But yes, I, like Dan, I'm also a writer. The most recent book is called What's Going On, and it's intended to be a uh, manual for direct service and family members of people with disabilities. But the one that's probably more relevant to this broadcast is Unlocking the Secrets of Self-Esteem, that's put out by New Harbinger. I also have two ebooks that were published by Psych Central. That uh, the running title is "Tending the Family Heart," and it's about how parents can increase warmth and positivity within their own families. And that was followed by, I was going to say, the son of "Tending the Family Heart" is <laughs> "Tending the Family Heart Through the Holidays," which actually we could have touched on tonight. That's another very common uh, series mm -hmm. of questions we get starting in about in October. What are we going to do about the holidays for various reasons? And then it continues right through February into March. The family holiday didn't go so well. What should I do next? So about half the year, about 25% or more of the questions are about family get-togethers. And, and let me just say, I've had the uh, uh, the great opportunity to read uh, Marie's books. And, you know, one of the things about them is that between the stories and the uh, the information she gives, it makes it very practical, very usable, so that, you know, when people read about, you know, how, how can I improve my self-esteem or how can I improve my uh, family relationships, the, the advice is really down to earth, really, really practical. Your, your writing's an ins always been an inspiration to me, Marie. You do oh, some thank really you, good Dan. Yeah. Well, we're in a mutual admiration uh, pair here because Dan just published a book called uh, American Snake Pit that I think is going to be so, so helpful in helping the general public understand the journey from institutionalization to living in the community for people with disabilities. I hope you'll give us a little thumbnail of that, Dan. Yes, please. Yeah, tell us, really, tell us about your new book. Yeah, it's a memoir. I uh, ended up opening up uh, one of the first experimental group homes to take out some very involved people with many, many disabilities, uh, intellectual, psychiatric, and sometimes physical disabilities out of uh, Willowbrook, which was the worst institution in uh, in America. And it was really what happened when we tried to move into the community. It was not thought possible to take people with this these kind of problems and somehow find a way to bring them into the community. And along the short of it, here's a spoiler alert. They do well. <laughs> <laughs> the book is really about hope, teaching you know, through story uh, that even in the most dire circumstances, when people are given the right, uh, the right configuration, the right support, the, some of the decent things in life that they weren't given in the institution, when you're given the right opportunity, people can flourish. I've, I've actually set it up, if it's appropriate, for any, anybody listening to this, if they want to get the first two chapters free, they can just text chapters to uh, 44222 and they'll get those two chapters free. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. We'll also put that down Thank in our you. show notes as well. Dan and Marie, you are both awesome. I, I wish that we could Thank do you. one show a month with the two of you. You have great chemistry. We should also mention, in addition to writing the Ask the Therapist column, Dan and Marie have been featured in a number of videos that you can find on youtube.com slash psych central under Ask the Therapist. Uh, you can also find them on our Facebook page as well. Just look for various questions and, well, Dan and Marie's head answering questions. It's, it's pretty simple. <laughs> it's a great format, just a, a question, a couple of minutes, and you might even recognize the question asker's voice. I won't tell you who it is. We'll leave it to be a mystery. Thank you again for being on the show. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Gabe. Thank, Thank you, Vincent. My pleasure. All right. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in this week. And remember, you can get one week of free, convenient, affordable, private online counseling anytime, anywhere by visiting betterhelp.com slash psychcentral. We will see you next week.
Thank you for listening to The Psych Central Show. Please rate, review and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you found this podcast. We encourage you to share our show on social media and with friends and family. Previous episodes can be found at psychcentral.com slash show. Psychcentral.com is the Internet's oldest and largest independent mental health website. Psych Central is overseen by Dr. John Grohall, a mental health expert and one of the pioneering leaders in online mental health. Our host, Gabe Howard, is an award-winning writer and speaker who travels nationally. You can find more information on Gabe at GabeHoward.com. Our co-host, Vincent M. Wales, is a trained suicide prevention crisis counsellor and author of several award-winning speculative fiction novels. You can learn more about Vincent at VincentMWales.com. If you have feedback about the show, please email talkback at psychcentral.com.